Welcome to Analyst Crossfire, an ISC 17 panel featuring expert voices from the international supercomputing community giving their reactions to some of the top HPC trends as discussed at this year's conference. I'm Addison Snell with Intersect 360 Research, and I'm the moderator of this panel. Having selected four experts with different perspectives from across the HPC community, these four have volunteered to play the analyst with me by sharing their personal opinions on current and future supercomputing trends. I'm very excited to have this year on my panel an expert from International Exascale Program from the U.S. University of Chicago and Argonne National Labs, Rick Stevens. Rick, thanks for being on the panel. And then pinch hitting for De Pechon, who is detained, uh, Martin Palkovich from the Czech National Supercomputing Center has volunteered to step right in and take these questions on the fly. So Martin, I'm especially excited that you've volunteered to jump in. I'll call on you, uh, I won't go to you first right away, I'll let you warm up to them. These two are joined by two experts from noteworthy HPC technology companies. First is from HPE, which is the leading HPC systems company by revenue worldwide, Vice President and General Manager for HPC, Bill Manel. Bill, thanks for being here. And finally, from Penguin Computing, a company with a growing presence in HPC and hyperscale, Vice President of Advanced Solutions, Yusi Kakonin. Yusi, thank you for joining the Analyst Crossfire panel. <clears throat> Panelists, thank you for joining me for ISC Analyst Crossfire. The clock is running, and we're going to get started. Topic number one is AI meets HPC. One of the biggest topics at ISC this week has been artificial intelligence and the overlap of deep learning with HPC. Certainly these applications are consuming HPC technologies and influencing roadmaps. The question is, what effect will AI have on existing established HPC applications? How are things going to evolve? Bill, I'm gonna start with you. Yeah, I think that what, what, what you'll see over time is the fact that the, um, as we gather in more data, uh, and we'll use the data as a basis for building essentially the equations. Now we'll have two ways of looking at systems. We'll start with equations and use modeling to create data, and then we'll start with data and use, use uh, AI to basically create equations. And if I talk to customers, and especially heavy manufacturing, that's what they expect to do. They'll do much more product development that's based upon gathering real-time sensor data as the thing flies or the thing drives from that perspective. So I think it's gonna change fairly significantly. I don't think the, the applications will go away, but I think they'll be supplemented. They'll be supplemented in terms of big data, or sorry, not big data, artificial intelligence influencing how the HPC is done. That's correct. Yusi, what do you think? So basically, um, if you have deployment experience from um, both, both from um, top 500 class um, cluster comp conventional HPC, HPC environments as well as recent uh, large-scale AI environments, AI analytics environments, and um, we tend to consider um, from, from kind of um, deployment and operational perspective, we tend to consider um, AI as a, as a special case of HPC, it's a, or subcategory of HPC, if you will. And, um, and, and, and granted, um, AI does drive some, uh, more recently, AI does drive some specific silicon level design features and, and, and so forth. But um, just looking at the broader picture, uh, a lot, of the, a lot of the surrounding technologies for, for fabric interconnects and, and for, for storage uh, high, high, um, high, high, to, to enable this, this analytics. Um, the, the interconnects and storage, they, 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 are, they are very much similar. They, they, it basically, AI does create a broader market, um, higher demand for high, high, higher, higher unit, unit deployments for, um, for storage and interconnects, and, and we see that, that as, a, as, a, as a net benefit also for HPC, for, for conventional HPC environments. Yeah, I, I get that there are similar demands. I haven't really heard much yet in terms of specific things that are gonna change in HPC. Uh, Martin, I said I'd, I'd give you a quick respite, so let me hit Rick first, then I'll come back to you. Okay, well, I think it's gonna completely transform HPC applications. So, in some cases, it will be, it will wrap these applications, so it, will, it will control the parameters, it will control the inputs to HPC, so HPC will become a subroutine that AI uses. In some cases, AI will get embedded in these applications as cheaper approximate function approximation for various physics or other components. Do you have specific models. application ideas in mind? Uh, it's already starting to happen in climate, we're starting to see it in cosmology, we're starting to see it in computational biology, fluid mechanics, combustion, I think it's going to hit everything. Uh, it just depends on how open-minded the people are building the apps or maintaining the apps. Um, and then uh, finally, I think in some domains, it'll just completely obliterate the applications because uh, where we have 
uh, relatively poor uh, predictive models today, um, and we have enough observational data or data from other models or data from experiments that uh, we should be able to do design uh, processes in particular that uh, are almost entirely driven by the AI pieces. So I think it's going to be completely transformative at that level. I think the second part is that the architectures that are good for AI are pretty crappy for traditional HPC. So if we see a big movement towards low precision, tensor operators, and so on, and that becomes the dominant hardware platform that vendors are targeting, and I think they are, then you're going to see a, a slow starvation of traditional HPC requirements in the hardware, and they'll have to adjust to that. I like your point about the quality of the models, especially as it pertains to precision. We're going to hit that later in the panel, but I want to get to Martin here since he was brave enough to step up. What do you think about how HPC gets influenced by AI? Um, I mean, my opinion is... Okay, so that um, AI is uh, extending, uh, extending the HPC, so I mean, we see sim uh, several examples already. I think it was uh, super commenting last year or something the, uh, where in Japan they model the tsunami and they also analyze Facebook and so on and so on, do some deep learning and, and uh, do better precision with, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the models. Um, also, like uh, when we look at the pharma industry, we have uh, several projects with the pharma industry. Uh, they get, uh, go at a traditional approach where they do uh, like computational chemistry to, to design the drugs, but then they, they start to have uh, a lot of uh, deep learning applications where they just uh, uh, try to, they have the matrix where they have uh, basically uh, the, uh, the different medicaments, then they have uh, basically how they react. Uh, they have some experiments and with the deep learning they, they feel the matrix. So, so I think it's, it's extension and the combination is important. But then we hit again the, the architecture thing that was, that was mentioned by Eric uh, previously. Yeah. So you see Penguin has these OCP configurations that are kind of these tweeners between hyperscale and HPC. Are you seeing that kind of cross demand and what kinds of HPC applications do you see that pull in? Um, we, are, we are definitely seeing um, just um, in many ways convergence of, uh, of let's say commercial cloud and hosting provider environments and technologies used in those environments and, and HPC environments. That, that applies both to the physical infrastructure, um, uh, the, the data center layouts um, and, and also the, the operational model, which is more around software and, and workflows. So, Bill, I'll give you the last word on this. Are you seeing particular customer demand from HPE to start building AI into the HPC side? Uh, you know, um, it's, it's probably early for more traditional customers. Um, I sell into a lot of service providers as well, and so... Uh, we're seeing a high demand in service providers right, right now. So they, they seem to be consuming a lot. Others are starting to sample, um, uh, starting kind of small and, and kind of moving up from that standpoint. One I expected you to hit for strength of HPE that I didn't hear you say was finance. That's probably the area we've seen the most where they're really using AI. I think that's going to revolutionize a lot of these pricing applications in particular where within 10 years we might do away with the idea of a risk tranche. You, I think you'll have a personalized interest rate before you have personalized medicine. I'm also excited about AI in the loop instead of engineer in the loop kind of simulations. But the clock's moving on, and I'm not answering the question. Issue number two is exascale software. We've heard a lot this week about plans for pre-exascale and exascale systems, which are drawing steadily closer. If we succeed in the hardware, the question is how ready is the software for exascale, including the operating environments, developer tools, middleware, and applications, and what more needs to be done? I want to start down there with Rick this time. Well, I think we have to take a serious look at uh, any practical exascale machine uh, from a cost, power, or whatever is going to be built on some acceleration technology. And I would say uh, one of the very little secrets is that uh, even though we have big machines with accelerators, we're still not fully uh, accelerated our applications. So that's uh, a big piece that still has to happen. There needs to be a lot of work done, whether it's CUDA or something else, vectors, ZM5, whatever that needs a lot of work. I think at the OS level, I'm less worried about it because um, the, most of the exascale design points are ex uh, extensions or extrapolations from the pre-exascale machines, and I think the middleware community has more or less got that under control. Probably the third piece, and this is, ties it back more to the first question, to the degree that exascale machines have to be looking forward, the workload on those machines is going to be balanced between simulation, big data, and deep learning. 
And right now, those three domains essentially have different software stacks. And so I think the biggest challenge is an integrated software stack followed by optimization of applications for whatever the accelerators are for that time frame. I love your point that we might not necessarily be there with the software, with the systems we have today already. Uh, Martin, what's your thought on software readiness for these large systems? I believe it, uh, it requires a lot of education because uh, basically uh, how we write software is it's, it's still more or less the same, right? So, and and it, those machines will require really a lot of training, a lot of uh, uh, understanding how, how, those, right. uh, how those machines will work. And uh, definitely also the other point is uh, to, to have the whole ecosystem, to have the co-design and to have the whole ecosystem, not only for software, hardware, etc. separately, but that everything works together, so that's important. Do you have an idea of what we can do to speed that along from the co-design standpoint, where this knowledge is going to come from? Um, I mean, for, for HPC is uh, a little bit uh, difficult because I uh, before I was uh, working more in Embedded and, and there it's simple, right? Because there you have one tool where you cre uh, create software and hardware. You cannot do it in HPC. I mean, the, the, the hardware loop is it's much longer, right, to do co-design. So, so that's why you have to think uh, very, very carefully when you design your hardware and uh, basically also think about the software in the future. Great. Hitting the vendor side of the table, I mean, you start building these large systems, whether it's exascale or hyperscale. So what do you think about the software readiness and, and do the hardware vendors have a role in promoting that UC? So, so looking at, um, let's say, a typical or average system today on top 500 list, those are typically in the, class, in the order of 0 0.01 exaflop, exaflop systems. And um, so... Um, Anybody who has, who has already deployed or, or operates, manages that type of compute resource knows that there is a fair degree of complexity, a lot of, lot of moving parts, so to, so to speak, parallel execution engines, fabric links, and so on. So um, basically, you can never, even, even with the today's machines, you can never assume perfect 100% uptime on, 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 on system level. And uh, this is further amplified in, in any kind of practical exascale system. So, so one, one implication is clearly that um, software needs to be written and, and, the, and the infrastructure software needs to be written to work around individual low-level component failures. Those, are, those, are, those need to be taken for granted. They are, they are going to be just a fact of life. And, um, and that, that's, that's probably going to be reflected to some degree also on, on, on application layer. And, um, and um, this is basically maybe an example where, where Exascale software stack will borrow some, some influences and ideas from, from commercial uh, hyperscale cloud, com cloud, cloud computing environments that, that exist today. Bill, HPE is one of the companies that got a path forward award on the hardware side toward Exascale. Do you have thoughts as to the software readiness as we head there? Um, well, certainly uh, to Rick's point earlier, I, it, I think as you look out and say the, the Exascale machine happens in three to five years, um, I, you know, I think as, as more and more of these, that we have this confluence of big data and AI and HPC and how that plays together, I think that's going to change applications. Um, so, I, so I think we have to get better at that. Um, I think we have to get better at uh, increasing the efficiency of the applications. Um, so, you, you know, we, we'll, we'll need to use accelerators and how efficient can we use those accelerators. Um, I think along the, the system software and, and uh, um, and bio side, um, I think we've got to get more um, efficient in, in terms of managing those, making them uh, more self-aware and self-healing from that perspective. So um, a large ex exascale system obviously is going to have uh, probably a failure every hour when you look at the, the amount of components. So, so how are we going to manage that and, and make that, um, that uh, easy to, to, uh, to keep up from that perspective? I agree with that. The notion that you're going to avoid failures, it, it, you just can't get there. The idea is how do you manage the failures gracefully in this context. I want to get back to Rick with one wrinkle on this question related to Path Forward, which is that we noticed that on the hardware side, you give grants to the leading companies that are providing hardware toward Exascale, but on the software side, the grants get distributed between government and academic research labs to design open source software that in many cases will compete with commercial software that already exists. What do you think of the different approach here in terms of the commercial companies for the hardware versus the open source software? Well, I think the I can't speak for the entire project, but I think our sense is that we want the vendor software to be as open as possible. We want environments we can build. We want to freely integrate open source software with the vendor software stacks, mix and match. Um, 
So to the degree that the vendors are getting on board with that model, I think future ECP investments might be uh, oriented towards the vendors. I mean, the historical model investing from the DOE has been investing in software projects that produce open source. And so that's been one of the stumbling blocks with investing in proprietary software. That, you know, we're still interested, of course, in maybe there's proprietary, very, very low level software that doesn't make sense to be open source. And that maybe could be funded as part of a hardware oriented program. But I think to really embrace significant investments in software, everybody's got to go open. I've been hammering this topic because we use this term exascale, and ultimately the difference between exascale and exaflop has to mean there's some productive application running at that level. So I'm trying to promote the idea of where's the software in all of these exascale programs. Issue number three, remember big data? Nobody has talked to me once about big data all week, and this was like a major topic not that long ago. What happened to big data? How have things changed and have things changed enough? Bill, I'll let you go first. Well, I think what happened to big data is the media got bored of it. So, so big data is alive and well. And I hate to sound like Dr. Uh, President Trump, but uh, you know, I had to blame the media a little bit on this one. So they lost interest. We've got customers that are using big data at scale uh, every day and production from that perspective. So. So when you say they're using big data at scale, what does that mean specifically? Um, that means they're, you know, in the, in the neighborhood of 100 to 150 to 200 petabytes of data. So um, they're regularly accessing it, using it to make decisions, those sorts of things. So big data in this case equals a certain number of bytes. You see, what do you think about big data? Are you seeing it? Is it a solved problem? Where are we? So, um, so big data as a, as, a, as a marketing term in media, I think um, it's, it's probably not as visible as it used to be. That being said, I think the, my current interpretation of, of the term big data is that it's, it's being basically relegated to, to mean this, this set of technologies that's used to, to collect and manage and, and, and ingest uh, vast, vast volumes of data for, for modern HPC and also AI applications. So, so basically what we are seeing is that the, uh, the deployment, uh, deployment of big data type, of, type technologies, both hardware and software technologies, that, that's very much um, alive and well. And uh, we are basically seeing the attach rates for uh, large-scale storage with, um, in, in conjunction with, with HPC and AI compute resources to, to, to steadily increase and ramp up. Okay, so what I'm hearing is that basically we had a big marketing message that kind of started to fade away, and there were some different solutions there, but, but things haven't changed that much. Um, Martin, what's your view on, on big data? Did it really change your workflows? I mean, uh, maybe I will answer another question. So why the big data are not so uh, so visible anymore, right? So the, I think the people start to be more careful when they are speaking about big data because often when I heard about big data and then I, I try to find out what is behind it, that it was one, just uh, one USB stick, right? So, so I mean, people are very careful about it now and uh, I, I liked what was said, uh, like, it was, uh, I think, in the morning session, one of the morning sessions, that, that really big data will come when the machines start to talk to each other, right? That the human cannot really produce uh, the big data when the human uploads uh, pictures or something. Uh, yeah, that's not the big data. Once uh, the, the machines start to talk to each other, that will be the big data that, that we have to then process and analyze, right? Rick, you were nodding along with part of that. Something struck a chord. Well, we used to define big data as, as data that's, that's bigger than the than the uh, scalability of the analytical tools that are used to try to analyze it. So anything, so it could be a USB stick if the tools were really terrible. Um, I think what's happened is part of it's media burnout, part of it was we were never able to, or people pushing big data as a concept weren't able to articulate finite transformations in society in the same way that the AI, you know, AI rhetorical frame does, right? So big data wasn't gonna give you self-driving cars, AI is giving you self-driving cars. Well, of course, behind training self-driving cars is a big data problem, and pretty much any large-scale AI application has a significant data problem behind it, but there's many data challenges, whether it's data coming from telescopes or from microscopes or X-ray sources or you know, accelerators, various things in science or, or you know, data uploaded to Facebook and in social media that is st still ongoing, and we have lots of processing needs there that in fact are not related to AI. I mean, just keeping up with streaming data proce uh, processing transformations um, is something we have to be focused on, which is why when I talk about it, I think of three distinct pillars, HPC, data, big data, so let me just say data, and then learning. 
And because the data has many aspects to it that isn't related to AI, isn't related to simulation, uh, it has special requirements in terms of system architecture, system software, middleware, algorithms, and so on that are distinct from those other things. And so, uh, but I think the reason the media got tired of it is that AI is just grabbing all the headlines. Um, and that's you know, perfectly fine. The media doesn't actually produce any uh, advances in big data. It just, you know. So does that mean we can cancel our projects to start moving all of our HP on, HPC onto Hadoop? No, well, Hadoop never was designed to be very scalable, and Spark, of course, made some improvements, and now there's things beyond that. So these I simple would swear frameworks. People talked about Hadoop at this. They, they talked about it not forever very long because ago. there was nothing else to talk about, and people didn't understand it. But you know, there was also this notion that it, that uh, analysis was being reinvented in the non you know scientific world uh, with technology that everybody thought was some kind of panacea. I, I don't you know. There, there was always this notion of, of trying to imagine some simplistic model is going to fix everything, right? And Hadoop, what became synonymous with the way you approach big data, or Spark then became synonymous with, and, and these are all one approach out of many that are needed and not particularly optimal for, for the hardware that we believe will exist in the next few years. So, I'll tell you, one thing I think happened from our perspective as analysts is people weren't spending any additional money. People were, you know, trying to incorporate big data into their workflows, but it didn't wind up being a big growth rate for a lot of the people chasing. You know, disk drive prices are pretty low. Uh, Hadoop is open source, right? Uh, people repurpose systems, right? They put VMs on. I mean, sure, people are just going to do whatever they have to do. Uh, I think it, it, you know, on the hype curve, it, it went very fast, but it was very, very difficult to explain beyond the fact that it was awesome and the big. The only measurable market effect we saw is a slight bump in storage revenue that had to do with people mixing flash into their overall storage hierarchy, buying the same number of bytes capacity total, but some of it was flash, so the total price went up. I hope you liked those really long answer questions. We're going to move on to the speed round. Speed round question number one. Rick, this topic you already kind of broached, so I'm going to hit you first. Is there a role in H? PC for single precision or even half precision computation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, there's many things that we need to apply high performance computing to besides uh, PDEs that could fully exploit low precision arithmetic, whether it's agent based simulation, is one of them, for example. A lot of uh, discrete problems can be addressed this way, and uh, multi precision approaches to even PDE solving can, can exploit, uh, you know abundant lower precision arithmetic. It's a little bit more challenging than just hitting everything with 64-bit, uh, you know, if it's, if it's free and easy. But I think we're going to have to address this because the machines are going to be very good at this low precision stuff. Martin, are you going to start AI. moving single and half precision into your workloads? Uh, I mean, definitely uh, there is a room for that. Um, I, again, uh, when we look at ASICs, right, so ASICs, it are so efficient and are so good because you can uh, define the number as large as you need. And, and I mean, more granularity in HPC, that's half precision and so on, so uh, that, that would be great, so definitely. Vendor side, here's that signal. Are you going to start working single and half precision into your offerings for HPC, you see? Well, we are already seeing um, interest in, and, um, and, and uh, deployments, use of, of uh, less than double precision arithmetics on, on, on specifically on workloads related to image and, image and video, video stream processing, surveillance type applications. Bill, same question for you. Yeah, absolutely. Seismic processing, you know, 8-bit eight, eight microphones that gather data. Don't, There's a you know, great specific answer. Love you it. Going. You, you can't make up data, you know, 64 bits, you don't need it, right? So you know, we're seeing that a lot. Another thing I've heard is that uh, related to your earlier point, Rick, sometimes your model isn't that good to begin with. And here you're doing a lot of double precision calculation on a model that could improve. You're better off, you know, you're dropping flops on the floor doing uh, extra calculation on a, on a model that needs work. Uh, speaking of software, commercial software, we're talking about open source and all of the emphasis on open source development plus architectural diversity, stressing the open source community. How does this look, future outlook for commercial software for HPC, UC? Uh, again, uh, speaking from uh, what we see, see us and, and our customers deploy and, and ask for, um, increasingly um, the, the software packages, both, both, um, both, both kind of infrastructure and management software as, as well as application domain and libraries, it's increasingly open source software, often open source software with, with commercial support packages or support contracts, subscriptions. So um, 
to, to me it seems that the increasingly the, the item of value is, is really the subject matter expertise, the application domain expertise, and, um, and software, which is often op open source software, is the, is the delivery vehicle for it. Bill, HPE offers some commercial software. What's the future here? Um, you know, but it's mostly open, so we've, we've tried to take a direction to being open as much as possible, build a lot of our cloud stuff on OpenStack, and so, so to, uh, to the previous point, I, you know, I think it's all about open source software and then offering the, you know, the services, support, and expertise around it. I think that's just kind of the fashion right now. It seems to be the thing that's taken off. Martin, what do you think is the future of commercial software? Uh, in industry, I think, right, because uh, we see that the, the industry uh, loves commercial software from ISVs and so on. So, so, I mean, they are experimenting also with open source and so on and so on, but they still have the, the commercial software as a reference. I mean, we experience it when we work with the car industry. So they really go for commercial software and uh, like uh, uh, Ansys Phone and so on, and then open form, it's just, I mean, they are using it, but it's just the second option. So well, commercial that you made a great point because Fluent is the number one ISV application in the market, but Open Foam is the fastest growing. Even in commercial sectors, there's a transition to open source. Rick, you're nodding along. Go ahead. Last word. Commercial users need support. That's the number one issue. And whether it's open source or proprietary is less important. I think over time they want to go to open. Everybody benefits from it being open. We need to build more robust support organizations, deeper ties with the research community that can feed this and, and smooth out and accelerate the, the ability for these uh, commercial packages, even if they're open, to scale, because that's, that's really a challenge right now. Ultimate short answer. We're going to church here. I'm looking for faith-based answers. Do you have faith, belief in each of the following? I'm going to start with ARM-based supercomputers. Bill and Yusi, I hardly have to ask you. You both just want to say yes? Yes. 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 The other two guys, ARM-based supercomputers, do you believe in this? Um, uh, yes, in the longer term. How long? 2020? 2020. Rick, ARM-based supercomputers. Yes, with appropriate acceleration. Otherwise, they're probably doomed. All right. Stay down at that end of the table. All optical interconnects. Are you a believer, Rick? Uh, yep. Yeah, I'm a believer. Uh, do you have a time frame? Uh, Probably later than we hope. Okay, so coming back this way, Martin. Uh, I would answer the same as Rick. So yeah, yeah, I'm a believer. Yeah. Vendor side, Bill, all believer in all. Oh yeah, absolutely. Copper's dead. Copper's. <laughs> How soon is it dead? Uh, probably two, three years out. Two, three years out. You see, what do you think of all optical? Yes, it's it's happening. The the investment and innovations are are have been happening. All right, we're going to start market. getting harder then. Universal quantum computing, Bill, you a believer? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you see, do you believe in universal quantum computing? Uh, I believe um, in commercial quantum computing. Um, whether it's going to be universal, I'm not sure. Okay, user end of the table. You just line it up to buy your universal quantum computer? Uh, no. No, <laughs> not a believer. We're lining up to make one. I think it's absolutely going to happen. Uh, I think if it's not universal, it won't be particularly interesting. And uh, I hope that it happens soon, and then we'll, we'll have some really interesting accelerators for our ARM-based supercomputers. You want to get really interesting, how about self-aware AI? You a believer? Uh, we are. I mean... Self-aware? We're self-aware and we're AI-ish. Can you prove right? that you're so, self-aware? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think it's eventually going to happen. I don't think it's necessarily going to be evil. <laughs> well, I hope not. Martin, do you believe in self-aware AI? Uh, yeah. You do? Do you think it's coming fast? Uh, no. <laughs> no. Okay, you see, what do you think of self-aware AI? Uh, I don't expect there to be a singularity event in, in my lifetime. Not in your lifetime, Bill. You believe uh, it? Yeah, I believe it, but it'll be a while. It'll take a while. I'll tell you what I believe on that. I believe we'll create AI that's good enough that you won't be able to tell whether it's self-aware or not. And then at that point, whether it actually is, because more a question of philosophy or perhaps religion. All right, last question is our traditional one up, one down. From your observations at ISC, can you tell me, each of you, from your experience this week, what was one thing that surprised you in a positive way or better than you expected, but also one thing that you expected more and it needed to do more this week? Bill, I'll start down at this end. Yeah, I'm sure. I think the thing that surprised me was, was how much AI has, has come in. 
you know, that's, if you that's look your back positive. Your, that's my positive a, thing, yeah, over a year ago. Probably the negative thing, I guess. I, uh, we were talking about machine learning last year, so this is building on that trend. I, I looked, we had slides on that last yeah, year. Yeah, okay, so I missed it, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it, was, it was my opinion. Probably down, um, I guess, um, you know, it feels like, you know, in terms of the activity around the trade show floor, not, not quite as much. Maybe it just wasn't as interesting. They know. set an attendance record, man. you got to do more to draw people to your booth. Yeah, I guess so. All right, UC, what do you think? One up, one down. Um, well, we, we, basically this year, 2017, uh, it, it's going to be um, multiple very interesting uh, silicon and silicon platform announcements, a uh, lot, of, lot of progress on roadmaps. Uh, basically, the platform wars are, are in some ways... Uh, on again, and um, that's, I'll give that's you ten points for that answer because we not only saw a lot of announcements around ARM, mm -hmm. uh, but I thought one of the more interesting announcements that slipped almost under the radar was Wuxi uh, saying there would be commercial Sunway Micro based on Taihu Light that they were going to mm -hmm. sell. So uh, that kind of came to me out of nowhere. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah and that's going. that's also, that's also um, the, the kind of. Um, um, Competitive, the, the, the act, active development and, and platform <coughs> options. That's also that's also results in a lot of lot of just uh, increased interest. Questions from the audience. Uh, questions questions from the from the um, from the visitors at the show. So so we are definitely seeing uh, good attendance and um, and 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 good, uh, very high level of interest. All right, Martin, you are a pinch hitter today. So I haven't given you a long time to think about this question, but we're looking for something that surprised you positively and something that you still think we need more from. I mean. Positively, uh, so as mentioned, AI was very visible because also like uh, there was a special uh, track on the deep uh, deep learning the, the whole day or almost the whole day. So it was very visible and uh, the negative uh, that I will skip. Well, that's fair because I didn't give you time to prepare on it. So we'll go down to Rick. Last word is going to be yours on this. One up, one down. Okay, so the probably the most bizarre thing I've seen was this 40 megawatt data center in Georgia that's doing Bitcoin mining. Um, <laughs> so uh, most bizarre. You so that's that's not not impressed down, me, it's impressed me because there. it was bizarre. Uh, I think <laughs> probably the, the thing that was uh, waiting a lot more from is uh, I think the top 500 shifts were really boring. Um, uh, not no offense, Thomas, for his machine, but um, you know, uh, not a whole lot's visible in the top 500 uh, machines. Well, is that just pent year. up stuff we're going to see? Well, you know, we'll, in November, we'll see, yeah. right? Maybe we'll have to do this uh, again in Denver. Uh, I think that's certainly coming. I'll, I'll tell you. Well, I was already talking about my positive things. I thought there were a lot of new platforms, uh, and especially around the architectural diversity. On my downside, if you're going to do that, I really wanted to see more on the software side. We need to see more on the programming models and application development going forward. All right, that's the end of our topic. Panelists, thank you. That's going to conclude our Analyst Crossfire. Audience, please join me in again thanking my panelists, Bill Manel, UC Kekkonen, Rick Stevens, and especially my pinch hitter, Martin Palkovich, who stepped in at short notice when we were a panelist down. I really appreciate all of them bringing their expert views to this panel. I also want to thank the excellent ISC events team for another successful record-setting and attendance ISC conference. I'm going to give a final wrap-up on our weekly podcast this week in HPC, and we'll see you again next year. Thank you.